Hi everyone. Today we're doing two sections, 6.1 and 6.2. 6.1 is a very fast section. We're just talking about sex functions of several variables. And then in 6.2, we're going to talk about how we take derivatives of functions of several variables. And we'll spend considerably more time in that section. All right. But to get a start one, the idea here is some functions are based on more than one variable. So in the past, we've seen functions such as y equals x squared minus 9x plus 2. And that's a function in one variable. So it's got one independent variable. The x variable here, x is independent variable. There's only one of them. Okay, so that's a single variable. In this case, it shows up in two places, but it's still the same x value. Y is what we call the dependent variable. And this shouldn't be new to you. You've seen this in the past. But the idea here is we've got a function in just one independent variable. Now what we're going to look at because some functions are based on more than one variable. Say we're looking, for instance, at how a student's gonna perform on the test. The score they get on the test may be a function of several things. For instance, it may have to do with how many homework problems they've done. It may have to do with how many hours they've studied. Well, those are two different variables that could affect how the student does on the test. Or, for instance, this think of the stock market. If we're looking at a stock, maybe the stock market in general, if the stock up or down, obviously that's going to depend on several different variables. One variable might be consumer sentiment. One variable might be interest rates. One variable may be I don't know, I'm drawing a blank right here, um, but it may have to do with supply and demand. So those types of things, but it would be based on several different things. Okay, so now we may have more than one. Independent variable, and I'll show you a couple ways that you'll see it written. So instead of up here, we had y equals, we could have also written that as x equals x squared minus 9x plus 2. And that x on both sides, that's signifying, oh yeah, x is the variable. So the f of x, they're telling us here's a function, it's in the variable x, and then we see the x is on the right side as well. So similar to that, we may see f of x, y. This is telling us, oh, there's two x is an independent variable, y is also an independent variable. They're both affecting what's happening to the function f. And so it may be something simple like 3x minus 9y squared. That would be a function in two variables, both x and y. We'd plug them both in to find out what the value is. Now the other way to write that, again, that's Newton's notation. Leibniz notation may say something like z is equal to 3x minus 9y squared. And I want to write it in both ways to look at it because we're going to talk about in the next session, we're talking about derivatives. And so we write the derivative slightly different depending on which of these forms the original function is written in. But both of these say the exact same thing. Z in this case is the dependent variable. It depends on what X and Y are. Okay, so that's that. And in this section, all they're doing is they're going to give us some values. So let me, for instance, let's go to just number two out of the book. We'll get move that out of the way. So this is on page 531. And then we look, what they tell us, it says for f of x, y,
they give us the function is in parentheses, they have y squared plus 2xy, and then the whole thing cubed. And they say find, and they give us a couple of these. They give us three, actually. I'm only going to do two of them. F of negative two, zero, and F of three, two. Okay, so let's find these in turn. So we'd say F of negative two, zero, and as you would expect, the negative two is the X and the zero is the Y. So we just plug them in. I guess I could have put that here just as well. We just plug them into the formula. Oh, there was a Y, zero plus two, x was negative two, y was zero, and then I'm gonna cube the whole thing. Well, this ends up not being terribly exciting because I get zero plus zero, since I'm multiplying by that zero in the end, and I'm cubing the whole thing, which is just zero cubed, so I get zero. Now again, this is the function value at those two x and y values. So now we may be in three dimensional world where we're not on the plane like on the whiteboard, but we're actually in space. So if we went negative two in the x direction, zero in the y direction, our z value or our third value is gonna be zero. So it's gonna be a three dimensional point is what that is and that's the other variable. Okay, they also give us three f of three two and we do the same thing. That's still just x and y, we just plug them in. So I get two squared plus two times three times two, and then I cube the whole thing. So there's a little more going on. Numbers are a little bigger. Two squared is four plus three times two is six times two is 12 cubed. So I get 16 cubed, which I do not know what that is off the top of my head. So I will use my calculator, 16 cubed, and I get 4,096. All right, so that's the idea there. And I notice all the problems that they put in this section are actually written in Newton's notation. So they don't have any Leibniz notation in this section. We're gonna to have to wait till the next section to see that. But let's go into problem 16. We'll just see an application of this. It's also on that same page, 531. It says the yield of a stock is given by, so Y for the yield is a function of both the dividend of and the price of the stock, where the formula dividend divided by price gives you the yield. So y equals the yield d equals the dividend and p equals the price. So the yield of the stock is based on two different variables. The dividend that is paid out plus the price that the stock is selling for. Okay, so let's go from there. And it says they're using the price on April 1st, 2014. Oh, it says on April 1st, 2014, the price of Texas Instruments stock. So they give us the price and it was $47.53. And the dividend was $1.20 per share. It says find the yield. Well, not a lot to do there. We just follow the formula. So what they're saying is what's the yield if we have a dividend of $1.20 and a price of $47.53? Here, let me clean that up a little bit. And so we just plug it in. Oh, it's, so there's my dividend, there's my price. So I plug it in, that doesn't look like a P. So I plug in my dividend, it's $1.20 on 
investment. And so I plug that in my calculator. We go 1.2 divided by 47.53, and I get 0 0.0252. 0 0.0252. And that's rounded off. The decimal goes on. But it says use percent notation rounded to the nearest hundredth of a percent. So we need to go to two decimal places. Now when I change that to a percent, I move the decimal here and it's 2.52%. And so that's the idea. But pretty straightforward. We just have more than one independent variable. There could be two independent variables. There could be three, four, five. It doesn't matter the number of them. We're just saying the function is based on more than one other number. Okay, so that's the idea. That's actually the end of that section. So from there, we're going to jump into the next section, 6.2. That's where all the work's going to be. So let's flip over to 6.2. Partial derivatives. Okay, so let's talk about partial derivatives. Now, here's what's happening. So let's, let's kind of jot this down. A partial derivative, that is not a P, a partial derivative let's underline that that's what we're defining takes the derivative of one variable at a time and not only is it one variable to at a time, but I'll put a semicolon there, keeping the other, and I'm going to say variable, but I'm going to put it in parentheses as a constant. And so the big thing here that you're going to have to wrap your head around is looking at something, say a Y, and in your mind thinking it's constant. It might be a five, might be a seven, might be a negative three. I don't know what the value is, but I have to treat it as a constant. So that's the big idea. Because the thought is, say I've got a, a function in X and Y, and let's just make up a nice simple one. So say for example, I have F of X, Y, and it's 3x plus 5y. And so the question becomes, well, I can look at this, because think about we're talking about derivatives. We're talking about the rate of change of the function. Well, in order to see how x affects the function, we need to pretend y is a constant. Not really pretend it's a constant, but we have to say, okay, let's not let y change. I only want to see what happens to the function when x changes. So we keep y as a constant, and we only change x. And so let me show you off to the side sort of the idea of this. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show it to you, but let me take these partial derivatives first. Now, when I take a partial derivative of the function f, but I'm using x as my variable, the way that I write this is I write F with a little X notation. So it's going to look like this. And what that is, is that's the derivative of F, but X is the variable. So this is, we call it the partial derivative. And it's partial because they're both X and Y are not changing. Partial derivative of F we say with respect to x, in other words, x is the variable. We'll say so, x is the variable. And I'll put in parentheses y is constant. Let's move that up so. Okay, so let's look. 
So if I take this derivative and I look at this 3x, the derivative of 3x is just 3. We know that. That's nothing special. But now I look at this plus 5y. Remember, y is not a variable. I'm only letting x vary. y is a constant. So that 5y is the same as saying 5 times 2. It would just be some number. But since that number, in that case, 10, since that number wouldn't change, its derivative doesn't change, so the derivative is 0. Since y is not a variable, in this case, we're treating it as a constant. We're just treating x as the variable. We're only letting x change. We get the derivative of that, which gives me a 3. Here's what I meant. Let me show you off to the side. Here's an example of what I mean. So let's do a little, kind of like a t-chart, but there's going to be more variables. So I've got my x variable, I've got my y variable, and I've got my function f of x, y, which is really 3x plus 5y. All right, let's look what's happening there. Suppose x and y are both 1. Well, if I plug 1 in here, 3 times 1 plus 5 times 1, I get 8. I'm letting x change, but not y. So y has to stay 1. It's not changing. x is changing. Now it's a 2. Well, if I go over and I plug that in, now I have 3 times 2 plus 5 times 1. So now I have 6 plus 1 is 11. And the change here was that th it's this 3. That's what I mean by we're letting x change, but not y. If I let x change again, and we're just going up by 1, because that's when we talk about the slope, we says, oh, when the variable changes by 1, what happens to the function? Again, I'm not letting y change. So now I've got 3 times 3 plus still 5 times 1. And now I have 9 plus 5, which is 14. How'd the function change? Went up by 3 again. That's what I mean by if I let x change by 1, the function goes up by 3. So that's what we're talking about there. So if I go the next step and I say, well, let's look at the partial derivative with respect to y. This time y is changing, x is held still. So now when I look at 3x, so I'm looking back up here, the original function, and I'm saying if x is a constant now, and I take the derivative, the derivative of a constant is 0. This is a variable. So when y goes up 1, the function value goes up 5. I just take that normal derivative of the 5y as if it was just y was the variable, which it is in this case because that's how I'm treating it. And so the partial derivative is just 5, saying, hey, if x doesn't change, but y increases by 1, the whole function value goes up by 5. That's the idea. If you can get your head around that, the rest of the section is pretty straightforward. And we're just going to do a bunch of examples to try to get our head around that. And some of you have figured out. And some of you are like, oh, this is going to be easy. And in fact, you're absolutely right. But some of you are like, I have absolutely no idea what you did. And that's perfectly okay as well. Stick with it. Let's do some more examples. And as we go, try to make sure you can figure out what's going on. Okay. Again, my suggestion is as you're going through these sections to study, you may want to, when I write down a problem, pause the video, work through the problem, and see if you get the same answer I do. Because then I'll do it and you say, oh, I should do this. Or, yeah, I was right. I, I have that. I understand it. But I think that's a very good way to practice. All right, let's look at another one. We're going to make it a little bit harder. Some of you are not happy about that, but that's okay. So here, let me write this, this just so that we have this with it. So if I write the f sub y, partial derivative of f with respect to y, is the derivative, the partial derivative, sorry, of f with y as a variable
semicolon, so x is constant. That's why when I took the derivative of the x piece, I got zero. Okay. So for completeness, so that we see each of those partial derivative with respect to x and partial derivative with respect to y both written out. Okay. Now let's go a step from there. We're going to do another one. And we'll look at it in the same notation now just so that we get it a little more comfortable. So let's see. Example. So let's go f of xy. This time, let's say I've got 3x squared minus 4y to the third. Now, think back to taking a derivative just in a single variable. So say I had f of x equals 3x squared. We usually, to take the derivative just in our head, do the 3 times 2 and get 6x. But what we're really doing is we're keeping that 3 constant multiple there. We're taking the derivative of the x squared, which is 2x, and then we multiply it together. And we would get that. The reason I'm pointing that out in steps is because sometimes students will look at if we put a y next to something and they'll say, hey, but wait a minute, that's a constant, shouldn't it go to zero? Well, the three didn't go to zero here because it's a constant, but it's a constant multiple. So I'm going to extend this problem just a little bit from here and let's say, no, you know what, in fact, let's change this problem up a little bit. I'm going to erase this part of it, and we're just going to make it 3x squared y to the fourth. Let's just do one step here. The point being, when I look at this function, the 3 is multiplied by x squared, constant multiple, but when I'm looking at the partial with respect to x, that y to the fourth is no different than the 3. It's still a constant multiple. It still stays there. So if I take this partial derivative with respect to x, I'm going to keep the 3 because it's constant multiple. I take the derivative of x squared, which is 2x, just like we did off to the right. But this y to the fourth is a constant multiple, just like the 3 was. So it also stays there. The 3 doesn't disappear. The y to the fourth doesn't stay there because they're both constant multiples, just like the 3 over on the right-hand side. And now I can multiply things together and I get 6xy to the fourth. That's my partial derivative with respect to x. So I took the derivative of the x piece, all the rest of the constant multiple stayed. All right, let's try it with the y. So I take the derivative, the 3 stays because it's a constant multiple. The x squared stays because it's a constant multiple. But I'm taking the derivative of the y. Well, the derivative of y is just 4y to the third. And now I just multiply that stuff all together. I get the 3 times 4 is 12 x squared y to the third. That's my partial derivative with respect to y. All right. Again, some of you are getting it. Some of you are confused. And it's okay. We're going to do some more examples. But try these out. All right. Let's jump to one where we've got some of the, both of these put together. I'm going to show you some new notation so that we get used to it as well. So this is Leibniz notation. For z equals... whatever the function is. Um, should I make one up? Well, sure, we'll make one up. 2x minus 9y. If I write partial derivative of x, and remember, when I say of x, that means that's the variable. 
Oops. Still didn't spell variable right. Oh, that look, that's fantastic. Okay, the partial derivative. The way I write that is, aren't you ready? It's delta z over delta x, since x is the variable. It's very similar to writing before when we'd say something like dy dx for the variable. So the z on top, that's the function. That's why we write dz. And the x on the bottom is the variable, the independent variable. Now, we use a delta, that's lowercase delta, to show that it's a partial derivative. So this dy dx, that's just a straight derivative. I only had y was a function of x. So that's a regular derivative. If I have a little curly d, which is delta, then it means it's the partial derivative. And let's erase that. And similarly, if I do the partial derivative, of y, that times y is the variable, I write it as the partial of, oops, partial of z with respect to y. So this is similar to where I would have written if the function was f of x, y equals 2x minus 9y. This is where I would have said, oh, it's just the partial with respect to x. And this one would just be, oh, it's the partial with respect to y. A little more, it's a little busier as far as the writing it out goes, but you will see that as well. So on this one, if I take the partial of z with respect to x, again, x is the variable, the derivative of 2x is 2, the derivative of y, well, y is a constant in this case, just 0, so I just get 2. And the partial of z with respect to y, this time the 2x is a constant, so its derivative is 0, minus 9, and I get negative 9. All right, so we went through that one pretty quickly because it's very similar to that first example I wanted to give you. But what I want to do is I want to put some of these where they've got the two variables together and some where they don't so that you can get an idea of that. Okay, so let's try one of these and let's jump into... Here's actually one that I like pretty well. Mm. It's number four. This is on page 539. What they give us is z equals 2x cubed plus 3xy minus x. And they say, well, a couple things. They say find the partial of z with respect to x, the partial of z with respect to y, but then they also want you to find a couple values. So they say the partial of z with respect to x evaluated at negative two, three. Oops, that was a negative three. I'm gonna squeeze that in a little raise. And the partial of z with respect to y evaluated at zero, negative five. So once we find those partials, we'll just plug in those X and Y values and figure it out. Okay, so the partial of Z with respect to X, remember X is the variable. So when I look at two X cubed, oh, with X as a variable, I know how to take the derivative of that, it's just six X squared. Plus, all right. Now, 
next one, it says 3xy. Suppose it just said 3x. If it just said 3x, the derivative is 3 because it's constant multiple, the x to the first just goes down and you lose the x, you just get the three. But that y was a constant, remember, because x is the variable, that y is a constant just like the three is. So it also stays. If you wanna do it similar to what we did before, I would have said, okay, the three stays, the derivative of x is just one and the y stays. And so you get three y minus the derivative of x is just one. So this partial derivative looks like that. Again, the reason that y in the middle stays with the 3y is because it's a constant multiple just like the 3 was. All right. Try another one. Try the partial of z with respect to y. This time, y is the variable. That 2x cubed, there's no y there. So you know what that means it is? Just a constant. A constant all by itself when you take the derivative is zero. With the y, well, the y is being multiplied by the 3x. So the 3x stays, but the derivative of y was one. Minus, and then the derivative of x, again, that's a constant that goes to zero. So a constant that doesn't have the variable, in this case, y attached to it, goes to zero. The three x y had the y attached to it. So you keep the three x, and then you take the derivative of y, which is just one. And so this whole derivative is just three x. That's gonna show you how the function is changing. It's not a constant as we had before, because it's not just changing by a single number. It depends what x is to tell you how that changes. Think back to the idea of slopes we did before. That's what we're doing with partial derivatives. We're finding slopes. All right, let's do the other pieces of this where we just plug in partial of z with respect to x, evaluate to negative three. We just plug these in. So we go back up to this function and wherever there's an x, we plug in negative two. Wherever there's a y, we plug in negative three. So we go six times negative two squared plus three times negative three minus one. And let's see, we get four times six is 24 minus nine minus one is 24 minus 10 or 14. And with the partial of z with respect to y, we're evaluating that at 0, 5. Partial of z with respect to y, evaluated at 0, 5. Again, that's x and y. Just plug them in. So this time, that was just, remember, that was just 3x. So this partial of z here, we get the green pen. This partial of z, that's just here. So that's what I'm plugging into. So I say, oh, that's three times, well, x is zero. There's no y, so I just get zero. Again, that would be the slope of that three-dimensional curve at the point where x is zero and y is five. All right, so that's the idea. That's that new notation as well. Again, we're just gonna do some more examples. I'm not gonna be plugging in the X and Y. That's a combination of this section plus what we did in the last section where we plugged things in. But I wanna get more practice with just taking these partial derivatives. So let's see, let's do a, well, let's jump up to problem 14. That'll give us a good example. Still on the same page, still on 539. But it says f of x, y equals y times the ln of x plus 2y. All right, so now it's getting a little more difficult. You may need to practice and review the last problems we did to get some more practice on those. 
to understand because now we're kind of jumping into it. Okay, and the problem just says find. Now notice we don't have z equals, we have f of x, y. So they're gonna say find the partial of f with respect to x and the partial of f with respect to y. I like Newton's notation a lot better. All right, so now x is the variable. So see that y in front right here? That's a constant multiple, it just stays. Doesn't go anywhere. Just like saying we had eight times the ln. Again, since that's not y plus or y minus, it doesn't go to zero, even though it's a constant, because it's constant multiplied. Again, if that's causing you grief, think back to if f of x is 5x squared, we take the derivative, that 5 doesn't just disappear. It stays there times the 2x gives me a 10x. So if the 5 is being multiplied, it doesn't go to 0. But if I had, for instance, g of x is 5 plus x squared, now when I take the derivative, that 5 is all by itself. It goes to 0 when I take the derivative. And then I say plus 2x. So notice the difference in those. That's why this y constant multiple stays. All right, now I'm taking the derivative of the ln of x plus 2y. Remember, to take the derivative of ln of anything, it's always 1 over whatever's inside the parentheses. We call it the argument. But then the chain rule says times, chain rule, times the derivative of what was in the parentheses, what we're taking the ln of, the argument. Well, again, x is the variable. So when I take the derivative of x, I get one. But when I take the derivative of plus two y, there's no x, it's a con, I get zero. So that whole piece is just one. One time isn't gonna change anything. So essentially, I have all this over one, I have this over one. So when I combine all the tops together, I just get y on the top, and the bottom is just x plus 2y. Don't cancel the y's because of that plus right there. If you have a plus or a minus down there, you can't cancel a y from just one piece. If you can factor it out, you can cancel it. I can't factor it out, so I can't cancel it. All right, there's the partial with respect to x. Let's take the partial with respect to y. All right, now, you'll be happy to hear this. Since that y in front is multiplied by the ln and there's a y inside part of the argument as well, we have to use the product rule. All right, so we're going to use the product rule here. So I'm going to do the first y times the derivative of the, well, we already said that's 1 over x plus 2y. And then the chain rule says times the derivative of the inside. This time, y is the variable. So the x becomes 0. Let's put that parentheses around that as well. The x becomes 0 when we take the derivative. And the plus 2y, the derivative of that is 2. So there was my first times the derivative of the second plus the second ln of x plus 2y times the derivative of the first. Oh, the derivative of the first is a 1. Now, notice I did the product rule here. And it's because when I did this last f prime over here, I got the derivative of y was 1. Had we tried to do the product rule when we were doing the partial with respect to x, we could have, but we would have had to remember that derivative of y would have been a zero because it's, because it's a constant. So it wouldn't have been wrong to do the product rule, but you'd have to realize that wouldn't be a one in that case, that'd be a zero because y was a constant. So now if I clean this up on the top, I've got my partial with respect to y. I've got the y on top and the, the 2y. That's from these two pieces here. 
and that's my two y. And then on the bottom, I still have the y. I don't cancel the two y's because of the plus on the bottom. That's not an equals, that's a plus. And it's just the ln of x plus two y. And there's my answer. All right, let's go from there, do a couple more examples. Let's do, let's do problem 20 and then have to jump down and show you something else that may drive you a little bit crazy, but hopefully not too bad. So here's problem 20. It says f of xy, back to Newton's notation. I like Newton's notation a lot better. Three parentheses, 2x plus y minus five, raised to the second power. And I want to take two partial derivatives. So the partial derivative of f with respect to x, x is the constant. Use the power rule, bring that two, where's that going? Bring that two down like we always do. Multiply to get six times all this stuff to the first power. But then since all that stuff wasn't just a variable, it's a whole function, I have to say, oh, chain rule times the derivative of the inside. Well, remember, x is the variable, so the derivative of 2x is 2. The derivative of y is 0 because it's constant. And the derivative of the minus 5 is 0 because it's constant. So that whole thing is just 2. So that partial derivative just comes as this 2 times this 6 gives me a 12. And then it's 2x plus y minus 5. It's to the first power. We usually don't write the first power. And there's our answer. All right, let's try the second one. Again, here's where I would say pause the recording, try the partial with respect to y yourself, see if you can do it. I will just go ahead and do it. All right, same idea. Bring the two down in front. The two times three is six times two x plus y minus five to the first times chain rule, the derivative of the inside. Well, the derivative of 2x is zero because x is a constant now. I'm treating y as the variable. The derivative of y is one, and the derivative of minus five is zero because it's also a constant. And so now I just get six times one, which is just six. So I get six, and then that same stuff in parentheses, 2x plus y minus five. Hopefully that is making some sense to you. All right, <clears throat> excuse me. So let's look at this next idea. So what they're going to do is, if you remember when we were taking derivatives and then we were taking the second derivative, they're going to do that same thing. So they're going to take what they call second order partial derivatives. <clears throat> Second order partial derivatives. And there's four of them. The first one is we take the partial with respect to x and then we do it again with respect to x. So this is partial derivative with respect to x twice. We could also do it where we do the partial with respect to x and then y. So this is the partial derivative with respect to x, then y. Or we could do the partial derivative of y and then x. So partial derivative with respect to y 
than x. Or, of course, the fourth one would be the partial derivative with respect to y twice. Partial derivative with respect to y twice. All right, so we'll do a couple examples of those so that you get used to it. I may show you off to the side Leibniz notation for that. Let's look to see in the book if they have any with Leibniz notation. I do not see any Leibniz notation. I will not show you that. Well, that makes that handy. Okay, so we only need to know this notation for the second order partial derivatives. Usually there's a dash right here, second order partial derivatives. Okay, now one thing to note on these, these two will always be equal, have to be the same thing. So we'll write that as a note, fxy equals fyx. In other words, the order that we do those partial derivatives doesn't matter. If we do x first, then y, we get the exact same answer as y and then x, always. If you work these out and you get different answers, that means you have something incorrect. Now, I would, here's what I would do. I would do each of those and then make sure they're the same number. I've had students on tests that will do one of them wrong and then say in their head, oh, I know these are always the same, so I'm just gonna write this for the other one without taking it. And they write the same thing and they get the same thing wrong twice not highly recommended, I would use it as a check. Do them both, make sure you look and say, yeah, they're the same thing. Okay, good, I feel comfortable there. That's not a guarantee, of course, that you're right. You may have, may have made the same mistake twice, but use it as a check instead of just doing it once and saying, oh, the other one must be the same. That's my suggestion. And let's look at some of these. And we'll start off pretty easy. This. 28. Now it's on page 540 in case you want to look in the book at it. All right. It's f of xy. And this function is just 5xy. And it says find the four second order partial derivatives. Find the four second order partial derivatives. Now, on the online homework that I put up there, that, that practice test, there is the practice test for exam three, and then I noticed I didn't have anything from exam, from chapter six in there. So then I had more practice for exam three or whatever I worded it and it says chapter six in parentheses. So do make sure you do some problems in there. There will be problems on your exam from chapter six as well as just chapter three. Okay, so let's take the partial derivative with respect to x. Remember x is the variable. So when I do that, five constant multiple stays, the derivative of x is one, y is a constant, so it stays. And you may have just gone straight to say, hey, that's 5y. Similar to if it was just 5x and we're just taking the derivative, we usually don't say, oh, it's 5 times 1. We usually say, oh, the derivative of 5x is 5. But if you want to do that intermediate step, you can. So there's my partial with respect to x. Now, that's not an answer because that's just a first order, not a second order. I'm going to do the other one, the partial with respect to y right next to it. Five is a constant multiple, it stays. X is a constant multiple, it stays. Derivative of Y is one. So I just get five X. Okay, now from here, I'm gonna take the partial with respect to X again. And I'm also gonna take the partial with respect to Y as my second one. So notice the first one, this F X X, that says partial with respect to X, twice. Well, here's 
and now I'm going to take it again. Well, the derivative of 5y, if x is the variable, is 0. There's my first second order partial. My second one is now I look back here to my partial with respect to x. Now I take the derivative with respect to y. The derivative with respect to y is a 5. And then I do the same over on the other one. So from here, I take the partial. I already did it with y. Now I do it with x. Oh, the derivative of 5x, if x is a variable, is 5. Notice these two are the same. And then I also do this one, the partial with y, and then y again, start to write x. Well, if x is the, if y is the variable and I'm doing x, I get zero. Now notice in this case, the fxx and the fyy equal each other, absolutely just a coincidence. Don't think, oh, look, I see another rule. Those always have to be the same also. Uh, no, they don't. And we'll see in the next, they are not. All right, but there's our first practice on finding the four second order partial derivatives. We'll do a couple more of those and then we'll do an application that has a similar type thing in there. All right, so this is problem 30. Go on to that. Yeah, we'll probably go on to 32 as well. F of x, y. That's the good thing about having this recorded. If you get tired and bored of it, you can always just stop watching. So if you're like, oh, I don't want to see another example. I already understand it. All right. But again, that being the case, here's my suggestion. If you're thinking, I don't want to hear him describe this. All right. Pause the video. Do it. Look at my answer. Make sure you have the right answer. And then you think, oh, yeah, clearly I understood it. All right. But a little more going on here. Partial with respect to x. Let's see. I keep the 3. The derivative of the x is the 2x. I keep the y. Minus. Keep the 2. The derivative of x is 1. Keep the y. Ooh, the 4y, there's no x, so the derivative is 0. So this partial with respect to x, let's see, we get 6xy, 2y. That's the whole partial with respect to x. You may jump straight. When I do this and I'm not explaining it to people, I don't write that intermediate step. I just go straight to that piece. Because in my head, I'm thinking, oh, the x is the variable, so the 3x squared gives me 6xy. And then the 2xy, the x goes away. So I'll just go straight to that answer. But I like that intermediate step if you're still having trouble understanding what's going on. All right, partial with respect to y. The 3x squared stays because it's constant multiple, but the derivative of y was just minus 2x, constant multiple, the derivative of y is 1, plus 4. Again, if you want to put the 1 here, we usually don't, but to be consistent, so the partial with respect to y, 3x squared minus 2x plus 4. All right. There's my first order. From there, I'm going to go into the next piece, which is getting my second order partials from there. So I'm going to start off with this. I'm going to do it with respect to x again. So the x becomes a 1. I just get that y minus, there's no x there, it's a 0. So the partial with respect to x twice is just 6y. Take this same partial with respect to x, now do it a second time with both with respect to y. The 6x stays, y becomes a 1, and then the minus 2y is just a minus 2. If you want to say times 1, you can. So you get 6 All right, try these out. I'm going to have to write a little bit smaller because I'm running out of room. <coughs> so I've got the partial with respect to y. Now let's do x. I get 3 times 2x minus 2 times 1 because x is the variable plus 0. And I get f partial with respect to y then x is 6x minus 2 Notice those are the same. Hey, that's good shape. 
And then the last one, we'll just make it a little bit higher. So the Fy with respect to Y again. Well, the 3x squared, there's no Y, it's a zero. The 2x, there's no Y, so it's a zero. The plus four, there's no Y, so it's a zero. So the partial with respect to Y twice is just a zero. Notice that Fyy is not the same as the Fxx. We get different answers. But the partial with respect to X and then Y is the same as Y and then X. Those have to be the same. All right, I'm gonna do 32, but I'm gonna skip that intermediate step. Again, to show you what's going on and hopefully you can figure that out. But let's try it to see if you're a little better. Sometimes I think when I show too much detail, it becomes too confusing. So you'll have to decide for me what you think. So it's fx, y is x to the fourth, y to the third, plus x squared, y to the third. Again, they're asking for the four second order partials. I'll, I won't write that, I'll just state that orally. But when I go f with respect to x, so the derivative of the x is the four x cubed, y to the third stays because it's constant. The derivative of x squared is two x, but the y to the third stays because it's a constant. Done with that piece. The partial with respect to y, I get three y squared. Now, if you want to do it in steps, you could say this, you could say it's x to the fourth times three y squared plus x squared times three y squared. And so you could, and now you pull the three out. In the next step, I'm not going to rewrite that. I'll just pull the x straight out or that constant straight out. All right, I don't need to see that original problem anymore because now I'm just going off those first order partials. So the second with respect to x twice, I'm gonna multiply the three times the four, so I'm gonna get 12x squared. Y to the third stays, again, it's a constant multiple plus the derivative of two X is just two and the Y to the third stays. There's one of them. If I do that with respect to Y, see that I'm gonna run out of room, right, too big. So with respect to Y, now I'm, that Y to the third, I'm bringing that three down, the three X squared, but I'm gonna do the three times the four. So I'm gonna go 12 X cubed, but Y squared. And then I do the same thing with the y cubed, the three times two is six x y squared. Let's see. Over here, I'll do the f y x, and then I'll run out of room on this line, but I'll, at least I'll have these next to each other to see if they're equal. Okay, so now I'm taking the derivative of the x, so I bring that four down, three times four is 12x to the third, leave the y squared, plus the two from the x squared comes down 6xy squared. All right, let's see. 12x cubed y squared, 12x cubed y squared, plus 6xy squared, plus 6xy squared. They're the same. So these, again, these are equal. And then my last one I'll do down here. Of course, it's coming from there, but I'm doing with y as the variable. So I bring the two down from the y squared, I get six x to the fourth y, plus bring that two down as well, I get six x squared y. And so I get that as a piece of my answer and I get all three of these. So those are my four second order partial derivatives. All right, let me show you this in terms of an application. And I will tell you this, I took an intermediate economics class. And in that class, the only derivative we did the entire semester was a derivative based on this problem right here. So this is 42, it's called the Cobb-Douglas model.
and what they do, it's a, a way they set up production functions. And they tell us here, the production, the units of production is based on two different things, X and Y. The formula here they're going to give us is 2400 X to the two fifths power, Y to the three fifths power. And in the Cobb Douglas model, those exponents always add up to one. Now P is units of production. Units of production. In other words, well, I don't know where that came from. In other words, how many units are produced? X is, in this case, units of labor. In other words, how many people hours they are paying for and why is units of capital? So how many they're spending to buy machines, automation, that sort of stuff. And so the question here is, hey, if we just add more labor, how many more units are we going to produce? Or if we just add another unit of capital, how much are we going to produce? So this model is very helpful because if a company wants to make more units of a product, they have to ask, hey, should I hire more people or should I buy another machine? And this is going to tell us, well, you're going to get this many more units for hiring people versus you're going to make this many more units for buying more capital expenditures, machines, et cetera. Okay. And then the owner of the company or the, the manager can decide, okay, which is a better way to spend our money to make more units. Okay. So first part A says, Find the number of units produced with 32 units of labor and 1,024 units of capital. Find units produced, that's my production, with 32 units of labor and 1,024 units of capital. All right, so in this case, it's just P of 32 comma 1,024. This goes back to that first section we did where we've got a function based on two different variables. We just plug in the numbers. So we get 2,400 32 raised to the two fifths and 1,024 raised to the three fifths. Now, on some calculators, when you raise to a power, it's going to put it physically up as an exponent. And then you can put in the two divided by five. I don't have a fraction key on my calculator, so I'd put it as two divided by five. I don't know if most calculators that do have exponent areas up there, you can put a fraction in. Maybe they can, maybe they can't. I can't speak to that because mine doesn't do that. But on mine, I will show you how I have to enter this. I enter this as 2,400 times 32 raised to the power. Then I have to put parentheses, 2 divided by 5. Close parentheses times parentheses. I don't need a parentheses there. Times 1,024 raised to the power parentheses 3 divided by 5. I need the parentheses around the exponents because calculators do order of operation. And if, for instance, here I didn't have the parentheses, if I just wrote it as 1,024 raised to the third divided by five, well, you do exponents before you do division. So it's only going to raise it to the third power and then divide the whole answer by five. That is not what I want. But it does inside the parentheses before it does exponents. So we erase all of this, get that out of our way. But that's how I have to enter it into my calculator. Again, if yours is showing a physical exponent, you don't have to do those parentheses. 
but I'm going to enter this into my calculator this way, 2400 times 32 raised to the power parentheses, two divided by five, close parentheses, times 2400, it's not 2400, times 1024 raised to the power parentheses, three divided by five. And I get 614,400. Make sure you can get that. That's the number of units produced. All right. Now it says find the marginal productivities. In other words, the like we would say the marginal profit would be the derivative of profit. The marginal productivity is the derivative of production function. And so we have to find the partial derivatives. All right, let's lift that up a little bit so we can see it. So part B, marginal productivities. So the first one is the partial derivative with respect to x. So again, x is the variable. So I'm by 2400, then I'm gonna bring down this two fifths, x to the subtract one, negative three fifths. And then the y to the three fifths stays. And so I'm gonna multiply the 2400 by two fifths. So let's see, 2,400 times two divided by five, I get 960 x to the negative three-fifths, y to the positive three-fifths. Another thing that happens with the Cobb-Douglas model is that those exponents when you take the partial derivative are always the same number just with different signs. All right, I'm going to make this five a little bit better so that you can see it as a five. All right. Now, let's find the partial with respect to y. So the partial with respect to y. Now I get my 2400 still. I get my, I kind of need to see my problem. My x to the two-fifths. And the y was to the three-fifths, so I take that derivative. Three-fifths, y to the subtract one, negative two-fifths. And now I'm going to multiply my 2,400 by my three-fifths. And I get 1,440. So I get 1,440, x to the two-fifths, y to the two-fifths. Again, same exponent, different signs. And then I'll go down to part C, which says evaluate the marginal productivities at the same x is 32 and y is 21, 1024. So Evaluate marginal productivities. At X is two, Y is a thousand twenty four. All right. Uh, you guys didn't even tell me. Up here, I wrote piece. Of y that's supposed, to, I mean, I wrote the partial with respect to x, that was supposed to be a partial with respect to y. I apologize for that. So let's make that change. So that second one was the partial with respect to y. I wrote that incorrectly. All right, so my partial with respect to x evaluated at 32,024. I just plug those in 960, 32 to the negative 3 fifths 
times 1,024 to the positive 3 fifths. Again, remember to put those exponents in parentheses, those in parentheses, if you need to. So 960 times 32 raised to the parentheses, negative three divided by five, close parentheses, times 1,024 raised to the parentheses, three divided by five. And you can close the parentheses, you can not close the parentheses, whatever you choose to do. So let's see. I plugged something in, I saw that I got the completely wrong answer because in my calculator I put a divided by instead of a raised to the power. So let's make that change. I get 7,680. Now, realize what this is. So we'll do the explanation here. I make 7,680 units more if we add one unit of labor. And what unit are we talking about? Well, right now we're at 32, so I'm going up to 33. So if I go from 32 to 33 units of labor, don't change capital at all. I'm going to make 7,680 more units. Well, let's see what happens if I add a unit of capital instead of a unit of labor to see how many more units I'll make. So the partial with respect to Y, oops, again, evaluated at 32, 1,024. And I had 1440. X, which was 32 raised to the two fifths, and 1024 raised to the negative two fifths. So I worked that out 1440 times 32 raised to the parentheses two divided by five times 1024 raised to the power parentheses negative two divided by five and I get 360. So we, let's make this a little more formal produce 360 more units if we increase capital from 1,024 to 1,025 units. And we'll put in parentheses keeping labor at 32 units. So in this case, assuming it costs the same amount of money to make, to add one unit of labor as it does to add one unit of capital, we make a lot more units by adding one unit of labor instead of one unit of capital. And let me check something real quickly. So we're in what? We're in 6.2. Just to make sure, since there's such a big difference in those numbers, let me look in the back, make sure I'm not pointing you askew at all. And I am not. So those are the correct answers. Now, even if a unit of labor cost a different price than unit of capital, we could take those number of units and find out how much it cost. So we could do the cost divided by the number of units and find out the cost per unit and see which one gives us a lower cost per unit. Obviously, if they were the same cost, we would just look at the number of units and say, wow, that's 7,680 is many more units we'll produce by adding labor than we would by adding capital. But even if 
a unit of capital cost different than a unit of labor, then we could find out the per unit cost of adding those to determine what would be the better way to go. All right, anyway, that's the end of the semester. That's the end of the semester. You probably wish it was the end of the semester, but not quite. We've got the other side of calculus still to do. So that's the end of this section, which is the end of the material for this coming test. So work on that. I will answer questions on it when we have our live session. So get that done. Ask me any questions you have and we'll go from there. All right, hang in there, get your homework done and we'll talk more later.